verse 6. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. This is God's word. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Thank you very much. Well, we stand out of reverence for the word of God. As I'll talk about today, it is something to be reverenced. When well, an auction company in Hong Kong reported that a cleaning crew may have inadvertently thrown away a painting that had just sold that day for over $3.7 million. The auction house reported that the painting entitled Snowy Mountain was missing, and video footage showed a cleaning crew carrying it away as they were cleaning, and it was never found. The officials may fear it had been sent to the city landfill with the garbage. Now, the cleaning crew, they had no regard for what the painting was simply just because of their lack of understanding of its worth. Of course, if they had understood what it was, they would not have thrown it in the garbage. But they were not appraisers. They were not auctioneers. They were not aficionados. They were not art enthusiasts. They were cleaners. They didn't have the eyes to see it for what it really was. Their limited grasp of the worth led to their ill-informed mistake. In a sense, that is the image that Jesus gives us in this verse this morning. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs. We are given in Christ... In his kingdom, a possession of such enormous and eternal value that our new nature in him to see that value must respond by taking care to protect that value, guard it, uphold it against the destruction which inevitably becomes of entrusting such treasure to the effects of the world, which is ignorant of its value. Of course, if they really had eyes to see, they would not have done such, would not have sinned. There's no telling what may become of you and I and the church of God if we let down our regard for what's been entrusted to us. All right? So I titled this message this morning in Matthew chapter 7, verse 6, our great responsibility to great worth. Our great responsibility to great worth. Let's pray. Father, You have given us what we don't deserve, what we can never earn. And we must never be passive in our obedience. But God, open our eyes, our ears, and our hearts to the unsearchable riches of Christ this morning. And give us a renewed zeal and vigilance to properly take responsibility to guard and keep what you've entrusted to us. We belong to you. Your church belongs to you. Help us to keep holy what is holy and keep pure what is pure. Keep true what is true. May we worship in the splendor of your holiness this morning as we hear your word from your unchanging, breathed out, inspired scriptures. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, last week we began chapter 7, and as we look at this verse, chapter, verse 6, we start off chapter 7 by saying, what is this new section, this new mega section in the Sermon on the Mount all about? Well, as it is the ending of his Sermon on the Mount, it's clearly about what every sermon should be about. At the end, it is about response. It's about how we are responding to the message of the kingdom. And he began by heeding us to a mistaken response, which is to take the kingdom, take this beautiful message, and then elevate ourselves in pride over everybody else, which always will lead to a heart of condemnation, to say, we have something that you don't, and we put others down. Rather, we must always remember that from the first day until the last of our salvation, we're on a level playing field. That we've all fallen short in sin. And that if it were not for the grace of God, we would all still be unsaved and damned. 
Therefore, we all have need of grace. That this message continues to save us every day. We should never think that whether I've been following God for 50 years or for five days, I'm in the same boat. I'm upheld by the grace of God. Therefore, our true response is to recognize our personal and ongoing need of repentance and then respond to the needs of others from that personal transformation of heart and have a heart of cultivation rather than condemnation. Whether as I would take this message and use it as a stone against others, no, I'm dropping my stone and helping others to their feet because the most effective means of communicating this gospel is the people who have been transformed by it to show that this has had a real effect in my heart. Amen. This is a treasure. This is a treasure. And that's my first point as we'll work through this verse is a gifted treasure. What is it we've been given that we need to recognize every day? Now, as we, as we work through that thought last week of not being people of condemnation, but of cultivation. I know that there are some, myself included, who may question, well, what about, what are we to do with those who are clearly wrong and unrepentant? How we bring to them this message that's transformed us, but they want nothing to do with it. They see there no need for it. Are we never to call out sin for sin? How are we to address the agendas of various lifestyles and life choices that are very blatantly in rebellion and rejection of God? what his word and his will lay down. Do we just accept it? Do we just allow them to live the way that they live and they can just, we can just be all inclusive of every lifestyle and every choice? Well, very clearly, I, I speak of various lifestyles and life choices such as same-sex orientation and gender fluidity, uh, pro-choice agenda, premarital relations, which are lifestyles and life choices which do not conform to what God says is my good will for you. The word of God lays down is very clear truth. How do we meet them? How do we meet them without judgment, but while upholding the truth? In a sense, that's the issue that this verse is addressing. We're not to judge. We're not to hold our stones up as if we've never sinned ourselves and do not continue to, but we should also keep holy what is holy and keep true what is true. How are we to relate to this world that perhaps is in blatant rebellion against God? Now, this verse, as, you, as we read it, as Nate read it, is much like a lot of Jesus' teaching to large crowds. It's a parable. It's a parable, meaning it's a fictitious illustration to communicate fundamental truth about God, but it's said in a parable so that few would be able to understand it. In Matthew 13, he says, it, it writes, then the disciples came to him and said, why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them to, you has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. This word this morning requires discernment. When he uses a parable, it requires discernment. It requires true, honest desire to know the truth. And when we have that desire, when we have eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to comprehend, which true kingdom-inaugurated, spirit-filled people have, we truly will understand it. And I have to preface this message, because I'm already partway through it, that this is a hard word this morning. This is a hard word to the church. These are hard words that I have to communicate this morning, but I'm compelled in my spirit to share them. And for a hard message, it has to land on soft hearts to be able to receive it. Paul writes to the Corinthians, we have received the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit Interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. That's very key for this message for a world that cannot receive it, where the message of the gospel is foolishness, where it's a stumbling stone. But for the people who really have the spirit to hear, and I pray, Lord God, that I have the spirit to speak it, this will land on our hearts in a good way. 
and we'll be, end up better off for it, and our kingdom message will be more effective. All right, so you ready to go with me this morning? Are you with me? All right. Well, this verse is, the first half of the sentence is actually two parallel statements. It's almost rhythmic and poetic. Don't give dogs what is holy. Do not throw your pearls before pigs. And the way I've arranged this message is by, simil- is by pairing the similarities in, these, in this sentence, in these statements. So when I'm going to talk about a gifted treasure, I'm talking about the, the idea of what is holy and your pearls. So firstly, what is holy? This is the million dollar word that we've all heard and we hear all the time in church. It's almost become commonplace, which is perhaps the issue presented here. Perhaps what Jesus is exposing in this verse, that what is holy has become commonplace. Because what does holy mean? What does the word holy in the Bible mean? It does not mean perfect. It simply means set apart, consecrated, dedicated, different. It means sacred. And not just any sense of the meaning of those words. Because in the Bible, the biblical sense of the word holy is such because of its connection to who is holy. What is holy is such because of a connection to who is holy. Isaiah 57, 15, For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. There is one who is holy. And everything else that is holy is only so because of its connection to who is holy. So what is holy these three words here, is something or someone set apart by God for God. Set apart by God to belong to God and be useful to God. And so when we talk, when we're looking at this verse and he says, don't give what is holy away, the only way that we could possibly do that is by first being given what is holy. Because we're not holy. And we don't have the capacity to make holy. Only God is holy and can make other things holy. So to, in order to give what is holy away, we first have to be given what is holy. So what do we have from God, given us by God, that is holy? We could run down just a quick list. We have the Holy Scripture, the Holy Bible. Right? This is unlike any text, any book to ever be written in the history of the universe. It is different. It is set apart. It remains what it is. Throughout every generation, it is holy. It is inspired by God. It is given us by God. It is holy. We have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit sent by Jesus to be in the heart of every believer, to be set apart, the power and presence of God in our lives, to be long to God, be near God, be useful to God. We have the Holy Spirit. There's the Holy Church, the Holy Assembly of God. Unlike any other gathering that has ever been, uh, ever happened in any part of the world. When the people of God get together who are filled with the Holy Spirit, the Bible says that we are built together as a house, as a dwelling place for God. Like the tabernacle when the Holy Spirit, when the fire, cloud of fire descended on the tabernacle. That's essentially what should happen here this morning. Not necessarily literally, we're not going to be in a cloud of fire, but a sense of the white, hot, thick presence of God should be in this place. We have the Holy Communion, which we're going to partake this morning. And I'll talk a little bit later at the end of this sermon. The the representations of the body and blood of Jesus Christ, which saves us, that, that does not save it in and of itself, but it is a symbol of what we have received through faith in Jesus Christ. It reminds us that we are different. It is our banner for the church. It sets us apart. This is where we get our life. This is where we found our faith, the body and blood of Jesus. Ultimately, none of these things are received as the holy gifts of God without salvation. We are made holy by God through faith in Jesus Christ to be right before him and to be useful to him. And the ultimate possession that you and I could ever possess ever have entrusted to us by God, which we may be liable to wrongly give away, is our very selves. To belong to and be used by what is unfit for those who belong only to God. 
are to be used only by God. We belong to God. You and I belong to God, no other. And he says, do not give essentially yourselves to anything else. First Peter, he writes, in First Peter, the Apostle Peter writes, as he has called you as holy, you also be holy. In all your conduct, since it is written, and he quotes Leviticus, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So holiness, holiness. All right, let's go to pearls. Jesus, in one of his parables in Matthew 13, the famous parable, he writes this, or he says this. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great price, again, went and sold all he had, and he bought it. So this pearl, again, has to do with our salvation. Now, what do we think of when we imagine pearls? I don't know if any of you are wearing pearls this morning. I know I'm not. But when we imagine pearls, what do we imagine? Imagine value. We imagine rare, rarity, uniqueness. Almost symbolizes purity, imperfection. Pearls, there's nothing else like it. The world. Well, how, what do we know about how pearls are formed? Where pearls come from? On the uh, American Museum of National History website, they say that a pearl forms when an irritant, such as a wayward food particle, becomes trapped in the mollusk, a clam or oyster. The animal senses the object and then coats it. And they say that it coats it with the same thing that's coated on the outside of their shell. And it gets harder and grows. A wayward food particle, a, a worthless, seemingly senseless little material gets entrapped in the mollusk and then is formed into this most valuable and rare and precious gem. Now it says we got to understand that that's each and every one of our stories if you have faith in Jesus Christ. Every single one of us were a wayward food particle, worthless, senseless, meaningless, and in the mystery of providence, God captured us in his mollusk and formed beauty, purity, uniqueness out of each and every one of us. He's forming us. And what we, we may feel is being trapped, what we may feel is being brought through death sometimes, is him forming layer after layer to make us even more valuable, even more rare, even more pure. God formed our story out of our mess, out of something seemingly meaningless. Right now, you may just feel crushed under the weight of the ocean, trapped in this dark, slimy, smelly thing called your life. And you don't know how any of this is going to turn out. You feel like Jonah trapped in the mouth of the fish. But can I bring you some good news this morning? And some good news you can share with somebody else. Jesus is making pearls of your problems. Amen. He's making pearls of your life. Amen. Layer after layer after layer. This is what we have and continue to receive through our life in Jesus Christ. It is the endless eternal blessings of Jesus Christ. That is our pearls. Paul writes to the Ephesians, Ephesians 1 3, verse 3. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing and the heavenly places. In chapter 3, he writes, to me, though I'm the very least of all the saints, amen and amen, this grace was given to preach the Gentiles, to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And personally, he writes in Philippians 3, 8, indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Jonathan Edwards, 18th century preacher of the Great Awakening, says, He that sees the beauty of holiness or true moral good sees the greatest and most important thing in the world, which is the fullness of all things, without which all the world is empty, indeed worse than nothing. Unless this is seen, nothing is seen that is worth the seeing, for there is no other true excellency or beauty. That is the image we need to have in our minds this morning 
when he talks about holiness in our pearls. We need to have this lofty, eternally rich and beautiful image of the reality of being saved in Jesus Christ and in the, the endless blessings that come with that within. That's what we must have this morning. What we have from God in his kingdom as we go to the next point. The next point, I'm calling a rejecting nature. A rejecting nature. And we're looking at dogs and pigs. Dogs and pigs. What do you mean by this? Now, in order to understand Jesus' mind here, we have to forget everything we know about, our, uh, about man's best friend, all right? About our four legged domesticated roommate or uh, emotional support animals and anything that makes us love dogs so much. Because dogs were considered pests and varmints back in Jesus' day. They were almost always wild and pack hunting beasts. They were scavengers. They were like the possums and raccoons and vultures of the day. You, you didn't want to associate with a dog, you didn't want to have a run in with a dog. Right? So, because of the nature of dogs and because of the distinguishment of the Old Testament law between holy and common, between what is good and what is evil, what is clean and what is unclean, the nature of dogs is, is an image here that is completely opposed to what is holy. So when he says, do not give dogs what is holy, those two things are on opposite ends of the spectrum. And so too with pigs. Pigs too, probably the more well-known if you are well-versed in the Bible. That pigs were unclean, unholy. Perhaps it's more familiar to us because of how much we'd hate to live in that time. <laughs> I mean, I couldn't eat hot dogs or bacon. That's right. They were not to be touched, not to be near, not to be eaten. Opposite end of the spectrum when we think about pearls. I mean, you just have to think about the nature of pigs, right? What's the personality of a pig? I think shameless, completely shameless in their lifestyle. And destructive, very destructive. I read an article this week, maybe you've seen it, about this Canadian super pig. Anybody seen anything like that? As Canadian super pig, it's a, it's a crossbreed between a European wild boar and just a regular pig. It's, they were uh, breeded to be able to withstand the harsh climate of Canada, of the, of the Canadian tundra. Well, inevitably, some got loose and they got out in the wild. They breeded, they multiplied. They're also breeded to multiply, give more uh, I don't know what you call them, piglets, right? To, to breed more so you can grow them more and more. But when they escape, they grow rampant and they're very destructive. And now they're moving down south into America, which is also a problem because we're from down south is coming north is American wild boars. Pigs are destructive. And so the nature of pigs does not render sensible and trusting pearls. Something so precious and rare, valuable. You get the image that he's talking about here. Do you see the flashing red lights? Now, I'm not going to take time here to explain why we can adopt dogs and eat bacon now. I don't think it's important to this point. But the important thing is the clear, drastic, eye-opening contrast Jesus is making between what is holy and what is common. Between what is pure and valuable and what is defiled and worthless. The dogs and pigs, the nature of which describe a life separate from God, opposed to God in rebellion, is to speak of the unsaved, unregenerate, lost, godless, worthless, useless nature of the world and the things of the world. Now, I do not mean that, and Jesus does not mean that in an offensive sense, because before Christ, we are all wild and shameless in our life. Hating God and the things of God. Some other scriptures, Paul writes in Philippians 3, 2, look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. Evildoers and those who mutilate the flesh give context to what he means by dogs. Revelation 22, we read, blessed are those who wash their robes, who are holy, who are like white pearls because of what God has given them, so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates, outside of the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices 
falsehood. Psalm twenty two sixteen. For dogs encompass me, a company of evil doers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. And even there you see prophecy to the Lord Jesus Christ's crucifixion. Jesus is not saying this in an offensive sense. We're not to always just go out and refer to the world as dogs and pigs. What he means to do, as I've said already, is to make this very clear, bold, stark, shocking, eye-opening contrast. But the nature of what we've been given in Christ, you have been made holy as a gift. You have been bought by God to belong to God and be useful to God. And he has given you a valuable life in Christ, the unsearchable riches of Christ, that cannot be bought or sold by anything else but by faith. He's contrasting that to the nature of the world without Christ. Wild, shameless, false, destructive, wreaking havoc in this world. Surely, I don't have to give examples of how that is clear. Our world is self-destructing. And he gives this big, eye-opening statement to quicken our consideration of how we are to correctly respond to the kingdom and our responsibility. And I have this question. How shall we allow this world to have its way with what belongs to God? How shall we allow what we've been given by God to fall into the hands of the world? Therefore, with these two contrasting natures, these two contrasting pictures between pearl and holy and dog and pigs, we consider the command because it brings the command in view. So my last last point, point number three, is a destructive mistake. A destructive mistake. He He starts off by saying, do not give. What does he mean by this? Do not give what is holy to the dogs. Well, the Greek renders this verb to mean, to help us understand that this is a moment-by-moment possibility. That's really what he means by do not give. It's a moment-to-moment possibility. In other words, there are situations, there are opportunities, there are moments in every part of our lives, in every day of our lives, where we have a choice to make as to how we're going to respond. What choice am I going to make in this situation? Am I going to go right or left? And at times he says that there's a choice that we make which is equal to giving what is holy to the dogs and throwing our pearls before pigs. Both verbs, give and throw, are the same word tense, so they're, they mean the same thing. But with give, the meaning of give, the point is to communicate that there's a willingness of our decision to treat what is holy as though it were common and to treat what is valuable as though it were worthless. Is a moment by moment. We don't always make this choice, but sometimes that's the choice that we make. There's a willingness there to make that decision. Psalm 19, 13 says, keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. It's a prayer to say, sometimes I get curious and sometimes I, I willingly make this mistake. Sometimes I willingly sin. Hebrews 10, 26 says something similar. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, after being made holy and receiving pearls from God, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. So there's this willingness to this verse here, a willingness. And then he says, do not throw. Do not throw your pearls before pigs. The meaning here is as to throw out, to throw out as if it's unimportant. To throw out as if it's worthless. And it communicates a carelessness, really. To throw pearls before pigs is to regard them, the pearls, as worthless and fit for pigs to do what they want with them. Right? Fit for destruction, fit to be thrown out. And with that idea, you understand how absurd and shocking and scandalous this verse is. I said, why would you do that? It doesn't make sense. If the cleaners had known how valuable the painting was, 
Of course, if one had true regard for the eternal beauty and priceless value of what they were throwing away, they would not throw it away. You and I would not make such an ill-informed and unspeakable mistake. And that's essentially the main point being made. That's the issue at hand. This is a destructive mistake. Do we have little regard for the value that is entrusted to our care? And we go on to see the consequence The consequence, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. This is a destructive mistake. This statement is to bring to our attention the reality that this is not some harmless, uh, meaningless mistake. There are consequences. It will cost you. It may just come back to bite you, literally. Not literally, but in the sense of the verse. Turn and attack you. He says, they, the dogs and the pigs, will trample them, what is holy in your pearls, underfoot. And what do we visualize when we visualize trampling? Right? We can understand what he's saying here. He's talking about damage and destruction and, and harmfulness and loss and pain. That's what it's going to lead to. Well, why does it lead to that? Why is this such a destructive mistake? Well, it's because of the nature of the image of dogs and pigs, the nature of a lost world, which you and I were once in. They cannot receive and appreciate and so honor the worth and beauty of what's been entrusted to us by God. They, they can't see the value. They can't see the nature. Their nature limits their capacity. When we're merely in the flesh, we can only do what the flesh, what is in keeping with the flesh. What makes sense to the flesh? We're limited in our capacity for the holy and for the beauty, holiness and the beauty of God. Then he goes on, doesn't just leave it at trample. He says, they'll turn and attack you. The sense is they'll turn on you. Now perhaps you thought that it it would be okay to feed the bears. Not, Not a good choice to think that it would be just harmless But they'll turn on you. Not only turn on you, but to attack you. That is to throw down, to wreck, to break. And the verb tense uh, is the same as give and throw, which means that this consequence is directly correlated to our choice to give and to throw. The, what I like is the NASB, the New American Standard Version. He says, Turn to tear you to pieces. Now that is bold language. Not just attack you, but tear you to pieces. He's wanting to wake us up and give us flashing red lights in our mind to say this is a serious matter. Essentially, our willingly careless regard for the beauty and worth of our life with God as we live in this world may just lead to a spiritual destruction of our own merit. That if we're not intentional about our life with God, to know what we've been given and grow in our understanding of it, we may just passively walk ourselves into our spiritual destruction. I'm going to grab Kleenex real quick and let you think on that. I can tell spring is coming. So what is this really, how does this really apply to us? That's what I want to end with this morning. The willingness and carelessness being warned of here for us is the mistake that Christians in the church may make on compromising matters of faith contrary to our new nature and being blended with the nature of the world. The mistake being warned of here is that we would compromise on what we should not compromise on and then be blended with the nature of the world. And often this happens, honestly, by a good reason, a virtuous reason, by reason of wanting to be acceptable to the world, a reason of wanting to be open and accommodative to the world. The motive is virtuous, and the common argument is, which I 
feel is the common argument of a, of a young Christian, young in spiritual age and young in actual age, is that I need to be friends with sinful people. I need to be friends with lost people in order to reach them because, of course, Jesus was a friend of sinners. So if I'm going to follow Jesus, so we use this as a reason to remain associative to perhaps those who we should not be associated with. And so we go on and we, we take this even further and say, so we shouldn't be so rigid on doctrine. We shouldn't be so rigid on repentance and confession of sin because we should just love people as they are, right? And just be inclusive of, of others and many people, no matter what. I mean, you may hear in there and say, well, yeah, that kind of makes sense. And Jesus was a friend of sinners, yes. And yes, we need to follow in his footsteps to reach a lost world. Yes, of course. Jesus said, I read this last week, neither do I condemn you. Neither do I condemn you. Yes, you've messed up. Yes, you've made a mistake, but I don't condemn you. But he also said, go and sin no more. As much as Jesus was full of grace, he was full of truth. He had an equal balance of it. And God did not love the world so that we'd be saved from hell and they continue to live the lifestyle which condemns us. What am I, I must also remember is that if I'm going to reach a lost world in the like manner of Jesus, I need to remember I'm not Jesus. <laughs> in the sense that Jesus was sinless. Jesus was tempted on every angle, on every side that any of us would ever be. He was perfect so that he would be perfect to save a lost world. But I'm not sinless. And even in salvation, as I grow more and more in the likeness of God, and as I grow holier and holier, I still have this flesh to be put off. And if I'm not intentional about my choices, and if I'm not in a place in my spiritual maturity and resilience, rather than be effect an effective means for the good news of the gospel, I just may be vulnerable and liable to negative influence if I'm not careful. Because those around us in the world do not have an appreciation if they're unsaved for the holiness and the worth of Jesus because their unredeemed nature cannot see it. He's made you a pearl. All they can see is the, they can't see the pearl. They don't have eyes to see the pearl. They don't have eyes to see God. And they cannot respect this nature about me, but rather will only relate towards me according to their flesh without regard for my spirit. We think of uh, when it started to become known to the world that there's actually dangers in secondhand smoke, you know? It's not harmless. You stand next to somebody who's smoking, you're breathing in the smoke, it's gonna, it's gonna affect you. And we need to understand that the fault is not laid on the worldly person for the negative effects on my life. Because I've been entrusted with eternal life. And so that I've been entrusted with the responsibility in my regenerated nature to uphold and guard this gift and possession of great worth, this great, great gifted treasure. Therefore, it's, it would be my failure to regard that worth that leads me into spiritual destruction. I can't blame the world for what happens negatively to me. Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. A few verses here. Blessed is the man, Psalm 1, who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor seat, sits in the seat of mock scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. 1 Corinthians 15. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. In the sense is, you do have a knowledge of God. You do have a knowledge of God, so don't go on sinning. We read this last week, Galatians 3, 1, sorry, 6, 1. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. 
The responsibility is laid on us to avoid temptation. After that great sermon on the day of Pentecost that Peter delivered, the, the crowd stopped him in the middle of the sermon because they were cut to the heart and they said, what shall we do? How shall we be saved? Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and all who are far off and everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other wit words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. Save yourselves from this crooked generation. I don't feel like we talk like that anymore. Save yourselves. As if you're in imminent danger. As if, if I don't guard this gift, I may be trampled underfoot and torn to pieces. There is a responsibility laid on every single one of us to be actively participating in our, on, our own ongoing transformation and to intentionally resist the impressions of the world to interrupt that progress. It's not the world's fault if I'm spiritually dead or immature. Because, again, I've got the Holy Spirit. And greater is He is in me than He is in the world. Furthermore, so that's more in a personal sense, but the church... The church, at times, in the virtuous desire to be more opening and accepting, has compromised too far on the fundamental and sacred matters of faith and doctrine to her own destruction, allowing the world to affect the church, and we're trampled underfoot and torn to pieces. Paul writes to Timothy, he says, This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, Holding faith in a good conscience. Because by rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith. Some have not seen life as a war. So they don't wage the good warfare, they don't hold fast the faith in a good conscience. I want to say that if the unwavering and unbending authority of the Word of God gets benched in the church, as the church seeks to accommodate. Right? Let's just put a pause on this and all the, the doctrine and the truth, and let's just see how we can seek the world and help the world. As a result, where the result is a church that is full of the world and a world that is void of the church. If the authority of the word gets benched, the result is a church full of the world and a world void of the church. What happens when we regard when our regard for the things of God fades and we give dogs what is holy and throw our pearls before pigs, we allow the world to shape the church rather than the church to shape the world. But you understand that every great revival has begun with getting back to the word. That's how it all happens. And the same is true for ourselves. When we allow the world to shape ourselves rather than ourselves to shape the world. Francis Chan, in one of his books about the church, writes, Many want to change the church, but it is often motivated by personal preference rather than biblical conviction. Personal preference rather than biblical conviction. That's what leads to the destruction of the church. If we allow the world to be the criteria of our communicating the message, right? I want to fit the message to the world. The result is we destroy the very message that saves. It becomes so conformed to the world that it, be, that it ceases to be able to save it. All because in the name of evangelism, we grow forgetful and dull to the supreme beauty and worth of the pure gospel of Jesus Christ and the power that it holds unto salvation for everyone who believes that there is no other name given among men, given under heaven, by which we must be saved. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except by Him. But if we open up all these other branches, then it ceases to be what it is, the pure gospel of Jesus Christ. But remember that parable about the treasure hidden in the field and the pearl of great price. Nobody was standing there with the guy saying, trying to convince him that he wanted it. Nobody was standing there trying to get him to understand that it is valuable. 
No, the purity of the hidden treasure, the purity of the great pearl, raptured his heart and in his joy sold all that he had. Nobody had to convince him. And that's the saying, the gospel itself enraptures hearts and minds and we are continually kept by the increasing measure of sight for the unsearchable riches of Christ. And listen to this. Every doctrine of the church to be known in the scriptures all upholds the gospel. We cannot say that we need to put theology and doctrine aside because all of that is realities about God that point to Jesus Christ and the salvation. The doctrine of the providence of God, the doctrine of sovereign election, the doctrine of grace, the doctrine of the church, in every doctrine to be found in the word of God is not isolated trees. They're all a part of the same root ball that uphold the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, all these doctrines, theology, that may make us yawn sometimes, rather feeds our affection for God and our glorifying obedience to Him. It is all layer after layer of pearls being added to our life to make us holy to God and for God. The strategy of the enemy is to make, a sh- to make shipwreck of your faith, to sift you like wheat, to trample you underfoot and tear you to pieces in the end. His strategy is really to get us to become indifferent toward the beauty and worth of God. To make us spiritually apathetic. To make us spiritually slumberous. Because if he can get us to be indifferent toward God, he can pretty much get us to do anything else. And he does this by distracting us from the truth of God's word. In the end, when this destructive mistake happens, what this leads to are Christians and a church that are indistinguishable from the world. By giving what is holy to dogs, we become like the nature of dogs. By giving pearls to pigs, we just fall victim and vulnerable to the nature of pigs. So, like those people who interrupted Peter on the day of Pentecost, I interrupt myself to say, brothers, sisters, what shall we do? What shall we do? How must we respond to this verse? What must we as individual followers of Jesus and as his family do in order to be uncompromised in truth and in our regard for the worth of God and yet remain obedient to meet a lost world with love, to make disciples? To not, to remain holy, but also to be in the world. To be in the world, just not of the world. How how do we do this? Well, firstly, as I come to the close, we all need a new nature. We all need a new nature. That we were all once as dogs and pigs. And so God has given us a new nature to be holy and to be Worthful. The lost will never be able to receive and appreciate the beauty and worth of God until they have a new nature in Christ. That goes for all of us. And we cannot change truth to fit the world because it never will fit the world. It is different. It is separate. The, the whole truth of it is that we become separate of the world, citizens of heaven, not citizens of the earth. But we'll continue to change it until it ceases to be truth, until we realize that the deep, rich, beautiful doctrines of our faith can only become so to anybody once we are saved and are given a new nature. Otherwise, Christianity just remains foolish and is scorned. And it will to those who don't believe it. So our prayer for yourself and for a lost world needs to be as Jesus taught us. The first thing he taught us to pray is, Our Father, hallow be your name. Which means open eyes, open my eyes, open the world's eyes to see what we could never see unless you help us, unless you do something in me. You awaken my heart. You open blind eyes. Hollow your name. Help people see your greatness, beauty, and worth. It's an evangelistic prayer. An evangelistic prayer. All right. Before our lost world can really see the beauty of God, we all need a new nature. Secondly, 
We, as the church, need an uncompromised commitment to God's word. What is God's word? It is the compass which leads us to find the hidden treasures of God in the many Christ-centered pearls of great price. If we don't have the word of God, we'll never find that. We'll never find them. In the very words themselves lead us to cherish the unsearchable riches of Christ and be satisfied in the boundless goodness of God. The psalmist writes of the words of God. He says, more are they to be desired than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Do we have that sort of affection, a hungering and thirsting after the word of God? Without the word of God, we are hopelessly, aimlessly living in the world with little regard in ourselves for the holiness that we have in Christ and the value to be guarded from the rejecting nature of the world. And we're vulnerable then. But what we must have, listen, is such a regard for the supreme beauty and worth of God that all else by comparison is as the scavengings of a rabid dog and as the sloppy stench of the pigsty. That's the clear distinction that we must have in our lives. That this is God to me and everything else is not worth the seeing. I must never forget that I, like everybody else who was lost, was as the prodigal son who did not know, who did not know that in the sloppy mess, in the sludge of sin, that he was hopeless and that my father saved me and bought me and brought me to be satisfied with the goodness of his house. I never forget. And the way that we do this is by an uncompromised commitment to God's word. As the church, Paul writes to Timothy, we are to be a pillar and buttress of the truth. 1 Timothy 3.15, we are to be a pillar and buttress of the truth. I love that image. That is just the blueprints of what we're to do as Crossroads Missionary Church. to kind of move through this. John Calvin, when he was 27, 28 years old, he was pastoring a church in Geneva, which he was actually kicked out of once, but then under the strain of the Catholic church, they asked him to come back to set some things in order. John Calvin had such a strong biblical backbone He was a warrior for the word of God. And one morning, as we're going to partake of communion this morning, one morning, they were taking communion. And John Calvin had a very clear criteria for who was to partake of communion. That you needed to be saved. We believe that. In his church, you needed to be a member of the church. And if, as Paul As I read this morning, as Paul clearly says in 1 Corinthians 11, if you are in unrepentant sin and clear rebellion against the word of God, you are to not partake of communion. Pretty lofty. And one morning, some people came forward to receive the communion. Is that how they did it? Who John Calvin knew were in unrebellion in rebellion and unrepentant sin. They were coming forward because they were going to take communion. They could not keep it from them. And he, he steps down from the pulpit, stands in front of the table, and says, these hands will never give what is holy to those who are unholy. I wanted to work through 1 Timothy 4, 11 through 16 with you this morning, but... I'll have to leave that. My point in sharing that story is to address the question, isn't that kind of rigid? Aren't, isn't theology and all that stuff and doctrines, aren't that, isn't that kind of rigid and borderline legalistic to have to enforce doctrines and creeds? Won't this keep people from being saved? 1 Timothy 4.16, keep a close watch on yourself. And on the teaching. Some uh, some translations say doctrine. Persist in this, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. You will save. It will have its effect. 
In the second letter, he writes, by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. My point in sharing that story is, you know, we're not so, you know, I'm not going to stand in front of somebody, right? In your heart of hearts, you have to understand where you're at with God and whether you need to come before God in your own heart of hearts, confess sin in order to receive in a proper manner as 1 Corinthians 11 lays out. But this supposed rigidity is really responsibility to guard and keep sacred what is sacred, to keep holy what is holy, to keep pure what is pure, and not to be mixed and tarnished, but to mean unmixed and untarnished by the world and uncompromised. Will that keep people from being saved? Well, the Bible says that's actually going to help people be saved. Because if you start conforming and, and changing and compromising, then it ceases to be what it is, and then it won't save. It won't be the pure gospel. I use a lot of movie illustrations, but you all remember the movie National Treasure? And Nicolas Cage is going to steal the Declaration of Independence in order to save the Declaration of Independence, and all the little things that he has to get through to, in order to be able to do that successfully. It's in this box, this glass box with bulletproof glass, with heat sensors and motion sensors, and, and, and sealed tight. It drops, I'm not even sure if any of this is true, actually, but drops down in this, this thick steel vault when it's not on display. And whenever they have to care for it and mend it and uh, repair it, they have to put on these like hazmat suits and this, uh, this um, controlled environment. And you think, man, there's a lot that goes into protecting that ancient document, right? That important document, the original document. And it goes the same for anything of, of worth and value in museums and art galleries, right? You don't touch there's rules and rigidity. But just as valuable, priceless relics are professionally and intensely kept, cared for, and guarded night and day, that they may be preserved and so honorably displayed in order to be fully uh, admired and praised for all their splendor. That's not rigidity. That's responsibility. And so is our responsibility to the truth of God's word. We must treat it with the same intense professional responsibility. If we treat flawed and fading material treasures with such vigilance, how much more the living and abiding word of God in our own hearts should we keep close watch, devote ourselves? Our obedience to this responsibility allows the truth to be displayed in full splendor, to be admired and praised, to save both ourselves and our hearers. And I might add our seers, because in verse 12 he says, set an example of uh, 1 Timothy 4, verse 12. We mustn't change the truth to save the world, but quite the opposite. We must submit to and uphold the truth to save the world and not to make the mistake that the word of God is vulnerable. But we are vulnerable. And by guarding the word of God, by upholding and protecting the truth, we are upholding and protecting our <sighs> Selves. This is what he means by it. do not give dogs what is holy and do not throw your pearls before pigs, but rather remember every day what we've been given, the nature of what's been entrusted to you and I, each personally. May it never become commonplace to treat holy what is, as, it, as if it was not holy, to treat what is valuable as though it were not valuable. But we must pray every day, hollow your name in my heart. Don't let me lose a vision. Show me your glory and this, for this world too. Hollow your name in this world. Show this world your glory. And may we be a people in a church that is uncompromisingly committed to, the, to God's inspired and timeless word, the purity thereof, which will meet people where they're at and save them the way that they need to be saved through the power that the gospel has in and of itself. And may that word open us all to the beauty and greatness of worth of God more and more every single day. Amen. Amen. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for that gift that you have given us in Christ and every other blessing that follows in you. God, may we never let down our regard for what you've entrusted to us, but would we rise up 
for the sake of your glory and for the good of others. Knowing that it would be unloving of us to try to love somebody by changing the truth because we would change the very truth that saves them. Help us to remain vigilant to our responsibility to wield the sword in a right manner. May we as a church be founded on nothing less than the living and abiding word of God. Grant us grace, grant myself grace. May God capture our hearts once again as we receive communion. May it never be commonplace to us. May it never be something we just do every month. But it may be, may it be just the very fountain that we come to to drink living water, to take in our life, to remember once again and never lose sight of it. The unsearchable riches of Christ. We love you. Thank you for this word. In Jesus' name, amen.